Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Howard Heller, and on behalf of the Mass CPR, the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, I'd like to welcome you to today's public briefing on pediatric and maternal fetal aspects of COVID-19. Mass CPR is a consortium of 15 hospitals and universities in Massachusetts working collaboratively in the battle against COVID-19. And today we have speakers from three of our collaborating institutions. When COVID-19 began to sweep across the globe, devastating some communities, the hardest hit were the elderly. Pregnancy was recognized as a high-risk condition associated with morbidity and mortality, but children seemed to be spared the most serious manifestations of the disease that we were seeing in adults. It wasn't really until April 2020, four months into the pandemic, when a report came out of the UK describing a devastating inflammatory disease occurring in children with COVID-19 and active surveillance started globally. Those manifestations became known as the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And finally, more attention uh, began to be focused on children. The development and the deployment of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 uh, occurred at an unprecedented speed in the first year of the pandemic. But as vaccinations have ramped up in adults, there are still many unanswered questions about vaccines during pregnancy and in children since they were not included in the initial clinical trials. We're honored today to have uh, four speakers address us on today's topic. Um, if participants have questions, as I'm sure you will, um, feel free to submit them in the uh, Q&A and our speakers and other guests will answer them uh, during the question and answer period. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Adrian Randolph. Uh, Dr. Randolph is a senior associate in critical care medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and a professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. She will address SARS-CoV-2 and multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and adolescents. Dr. Randolph. Thank you. So um, I am going to uh, I'm going to talk about um, our work in the Overcoming COVID nineteen uh, network. I see, I'm trying to put this on full. There we go. Um, about uh, severe complications, where a group of of um, sites across the entire United States, funded by the CDC to study severe complications of um, COVID-19 in children and adolescents. Um, and that's the overcoming COVID-19 um, investigators that, you know, early on in the pandemic, the um, COVID-19 in the young were, thought, the young were thought to be completely spared from severe complications. And there were a lot of hypotheses about why. Now, did they have fewer receptors in their airways to attach to the virus, a more robust immune response? because they're constantly exposed to cold viruses? Did they have greater protection from recent exposures to other seasonal coronaviruses? All of this has been somewhat debunked and it's really unclear why children are not getting as sick with COVID-19 as older um, individuals. Because in general, with flu and other viruses, children are highly vulnerable because they don't have um, to, to other severe complications from viruses. So as, um, as Howard said, the, there, in May 15th, um, 2020, a worldwide alert came out after case reports of multiple children presenting both in Italy, London, and New York with this same type of syndrome, um, often with shock, um, which means their blood pressure was really low and they needed medication to keep their blood pressure up in the intensive care unit. And it was called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And in the United Kingdom and Europe, it's called PIMS-TS, Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome and World Health Organization Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome. So a lot of these children had features of Kawasaki disease which um, are rashes, swelling of the hands and feet, um, cracking of the lips, this mucocutaneous, the skin and the mucous membrane involvement. And so people were making associations with Kawasaki disease and um, the treatments for it became very similar to how we treat Kawasaki disease, 
with intravenous immune globulin and steroids. And that's what a lot of these children are being treated with. Early on in the pandemic, the overcoming COVID-19, investigators collected data, which was published in New England Journal about cases of these uh, children. This was the largest report at the time, along with a report from New York, over 300 children describing the syndrome. And children met um, five criteria. They were hospitalized less than 21 years of age. Um, they had fever for at least a day. Um, laboratory evidence of inflammation, at least two organs involved. Most of these children had four to five organs involved and multiple indicators of in inflammation and fever for many, many days. Um, and they had to have evidence of exposure to COVID, SARS-CoV-2 virus, a prior test, an antibody positive test, or that they had clear exposure to a, a person who had COVID-19. Shock and cardiovascular complications were present in half of these patients. 80% of these children were admitted to the intensive care unit. And about 10% of these children developed coronary artery aneurysms, which is what you see in Kawasaki disease, which is a vasculitis. And that's why they give intravenous immune globulin because it's been shown to help prevent coronary artery aneurysm development, which can become a lifelong problem. So these children were mostly children that were Hispanic or Latino or black non-Hispanic. They were unfortunately overrepresented and all along in the last year, this has been the case, both in acute COVID-19 and in, in MIS-C. And it's unclear um, exactly why, um, but it, it seems to be a great part due to exposures. Most of these were five to 14 year old and previously healthy children. Over 70% were previously healthy children. Now, most of these um, it's, um, cases occurred after the peak of COVID in the population. And more and more um, studies of Miss c show the same thing. So it's thought to be the great majority of these patients a post-infectious complication and a lot of these patients are antibody positive, PCR negative. Um, immune dysregulation, um, genetic susceptibility appears to be present in many of these patients from our studies. That's new information from Janet Chow and Reef Jaha who are doing um, genotyping on our multi-center cohort. We've enrolled um, over um, 200 children um, in our multi-center study um, and genotyped them for Miss C. And we um, um, have, have identified many potential um, genetic causes that could explain why some children, because it's a rare disorder, it's actually very uncommon um, in the population, maybe two per 100,000 exposed. Um, however, we can't uh, discount acute COVID-19. We actually, in our registry of over 2,100 patients, children and adolescents have more acute COVID-19 severe complications than we do with Miss C. Most of those patients have underlying conditions and are not previously healthy. And although there's few fatalities, many uh, had very life-threatening illnesses and it's unclear what the long-term health uh, effects on their long-term health are. They are an unprotected population in general because access to vaccines was delayed and even now the 16 to 17 year olds may have access to Pfizer, but with the other speakers will get into that in more detail, but it was delayed to prioritize high risk adults because children were thought to be protected. However, we found that neurologic involvement in children is very common. Um, and we published this in GM Neurology, a range of severe complications. Most of these children were previously healthy, meningoencephalitis, other encephalitis, stroke, Cerebral edema, Guillain-Barre, which is like a paralysis, cerebral um, venous sinus thrombosis, which is one of the complications of recently reported with uh, some of the vaccines, um, and severe encephalopathy were um, found in a, about 43 patients across the, the centers that we were screening, we reported in this uh, case series. As new SARS-CoV-2 variants emerge, and some of them, um, in some countries where these are predominant strains um, have shown that younger people are more effective. Children now represent a large vulnerable population 
And if the virus mutates and does uh, become more commonly pathogenic in young people, we really haven't studied any treatments in children for this disease. Um, there have not been any trials of treatments and there's been no really rigorous trials of vaccines in children under 12, which will be spoken about further. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Randolph, for that really great overview. Our, um, our next speaker is Dr. Andrea Edlow. Dr. Edlow is Assistant Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Biology at Harvard Medical School and Physician in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, she will address SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. Thank you so much. When an emerging pathogen appears, obstetricians have two concerns. We worry about the mother and we worry about the developing fetus. And we're concerned about severe maternal illness and death. And we're concerned about pregnancy complications like miscarriage or preterm birth. And then we're also concerned about fetal complications like vertical transmission or in utero infection of the fetus, as well as birth defects. On the right, you can see some of the emerging pathogens across the last three decades, including HIV, H1N1 influenza, Ebola, and Zika. And all of these have had very high rates of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. So this left some of our patients when the COVID-19 pandemic emerged with some key questions, including what is my risk of severe disease if I get COVID-19 while pregnant? Will my baby be infected if I get COVID-19? And can my antibodies or those protective proteins that we make after having infection transfer across the placenta or in breast milk to protect my baby? So I'm gonna to try to address some of these questions today, telling you what we've learned about the increased risk of severe morbidity and mortality in pregnant women, talking about some of the reassuring information we've learned about fetal protection and that vertical transmission and placental infection do indeed seem to be that needle in a haystack phenomenon. But the interesting scientific question is, why is that? And then looking still at that Achilles heel, those mechanisms of neonatal vulnerability that persist. And we've seen that the maternal antibody protection given to the fetus or neonate in the setting of maternal infection does appear to be incomplete. And we wanna look at why that is. So the CDC keeps really good up to the minute data on the number of maternal infections with COVID-19 in pregnancy. And we see almost 87,000 cases in the United States to date and almost 100 maternal deaths. And we know from large epidemiologic studies conducted by the CDC and others that pregnant patients with COVID-19 are significantly more likely than non-pregnant patients of the same age to need admission to the ICU. They're about three times as likely they're three times as likely to need invasive ventilation. They're 2.4 times as likely to need a heart-lung bypass machine, also called ECMO. And they're 1.7 times as likely to die. So the absolute risk of death still remains low. It's about 1.5 in 1,000 because we're mostly dealing with healthy, young patient population, but it's still substantially increased in the setting of pregnancy. So in this context, you know that sounds like a lot of bad news, which is true. But one piece of good news that we've learned is the news about vertical transmission and placental infection. And we've seen that true placental infection with SARS-CoV-2 does appear to be a relatively rare entity. Rates were initially estimated to be about 7% for placental infection. And this was based on meta-analyses of case reports and case series, which themselves have a reporting bias and may overestimate placental infection. And in fact, in our initial cohort study across the academic uh, Harvard Teaching Hospitals, Mass General, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, in the first 64 cases of mothers with SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy, we saw zero cases of placental infection. In the literature, vertical transmission rates or rates of infection of the fetus in utero or during birth range from one to 3%. And again, our own experience across the Harvard Teaching Hospitals has now been with more than 400 babies born to mothers with SARS-CoV-2 in pregnancy, we've seen zero infected as detected by SARS-CoV-2 nasal swab PCR. So why is this? One of the reasons is because it's unlikely that pregnant women are going to have detectable SARS-CoV-2 virus in their bloodstream. 
And if virus is not in the bloodstream, it's hard for the virus to infect the placenta and therefore hard for the fetus to get infected. And compared to non-pregnant individuals, pregnant individuals are less likely to have a virus in their bloodstream. We also see that in the placenta, the molecules or the receptors that are required for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to enter and infect a cell um, have sort of protective patterns. And you can see on the right some placental staining. The placental cells are, are stained purple. And then these receptor, ACE2, is stained brown on the left. And TEMPRIS2, another molecule required for SARS-CoV-2 to enter the cell, is on the right. And hopefully you can appreciate that these are really kind of physically distant from each other in the placenta. And also TEMPRIS2 is expressed at a lower level than ACE2. And we also saw that with quantitative PCR. So these are third trimester placentas. The patterns may be different in the first trimester in particular, and that's something to consider. But we found these patterns to be protective. So the last point, how can a maternal infection potentially confer some degree of protection to the neonate by transferring the mom's protective antibodies across the placenta to the umbilical cord blood? And this is a public health strategy that's been employed for years where we know that neonates are vulnerable to death from respiratory infection. And so we encourage mothers to be vaccinated against influenza pertussis, which is the infection that causes whooping cough in order to protect the neonate. And we typically see that the antibodies actually are higher in the umbilical cord of the baby than they are in the mom's blood with ratios of about 1.5 or 150% of what's in the mom's blood in the baby's blood. But when we looked at what was in the umbilical cord related to COVID specific antibodies, this is some work that we did with the Alter Lab at the Reagan Institute. And here are two of the amazing women scientists that did this work um, on the right. But we, when we looked at how the COVID positive dyads, the mothers who had SARS-CoV-2 infection, transferred these influenza and these whooping cough antibodies from vaccination to their babies, we saw the transfer going up. So the COVID dyads are pink, and the non-COVID infected dyads are orange. And you can see from left to right, it goes up from mom to baby for the top. But the bottom is where you see the COVID antibodies and those are actually going down and they're lower in the cord than they are in the mom's blood. It doesn't mean they don't transfer, but they transfer at a lower rate than we see for flu and pertussis. And this was a very surprising observation. We wanted to drill down further on why this might be. So we looked at the antibody glycosylation profiles or how sugars are attached to the bottom part of the Y of that antibody, which is what the placental receptors grab and helps transfer the antibody to the baby. And we saw that those sugar patterns are different on antibodies that are generated during SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we think this plays a really important role and this was a major advance in understanding. So we know that pregnant women are more likely to have severe morbidity and mortality than people of the same age who get SARS-CoV-2. Fortunately, placental infection and vertical transmission seem relatively rare, um, but neonatal protection from the mother's infection is a little bit less than expected and less than we see for flu and pertussis. And this is especially pronounced in third trimester infection. So these are some of the great collaborators that we've had uh, doing this work across Boston and elsewhere. Um, and I'd like to also thank our funders and the members of my lab for all their work on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Edlow. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Katie Gray. Uh, Dr. Gray is an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School. And actually, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Yes, and a physician scientist in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, she will address the issues around COVID-19 vaccination and pregnancy. Dr. Gray. Thank you so much. So um, as we are thinking about um, pregnant women and receiving COVID-19 vaccinations, some very key questions emerged from the patients um, in our clinic and um, from everywhere that we were hearing from. Particularly, how effective are COVID-19 vaccines in this population as women were not in these clinical trials? How will infants be protected? What are the side effects of the vaccine? And will the COVID-19 vaccines be safe for pregnant people and lactating individuals? So at the time we undertook this initial investigation, Pfizer and the Moderna mRNA vaccines were the two types available. 
And to answer our first question about how effective are our COVID-19 vaccines, we enrolled a prospective study of 131 vaccine recipients across Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospitals, recruiting 84 pregnant, 31 lactating, and 16 non-pregnant individuals. We quantified the vaccine-induced antibodies in the maternal blood and the breast milk, as well as the umbilical cord blood in women who delivered. And we did this at three time points um, for the maternal blood and breast milk. Baseline before the vaccine dose one, at the time of vaccine dose two, and two to six weeks after the second dose when we um, see that the full comp uh, complement of antibodies in response to the vaccine is present. So what we saw here is that when um, women were um, and uh, non-pregnant, pregnant and lactating individuals were vaccinated, we saw similar antibody uh, responses in all the populations. So pregnant and lactating individuals mounted similar antibody responses to non-pregnant individuals as seen here by comparing blue, orange and purple populations. And when we compared these antibody levels in those who had been vaccinated to pregnant women who'd actually experienced SARS-CoV-2 infection during pregnancy, we saw that the antibody levels were much higher in response to the vaccine. So the vaccine antibody levels are seen here in blue, orange, and purple, and the natural SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, antibody levels are seen here in yellow. When we looked at both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, we saw that both induced um, a robust maternal antibody response. So both were effective in all populations. And then we sought to um, figure out if um, vaccination during pregnancy and lactation would confer any potential benefit to infants. So in this initial study, we had 31 lactating patients um, where uh, we looked in the breast milk and we saw that in all participants, there were vaccine-induced antibodies in the milk samples, seen here by rising levels across the time points of vaccination. Similarly, during this initial study period, uh, we collected cord blood from the 10 pregnant patients who delivered during this initial time as you might surmise, these were all pregnant women who had been vaccinated in the third trimester because um, this was a very short time frame at the beginning of the vaccine. And we saw uh, increasing um, antibody levels in the cord based on the time from maternal vaccination. So if it had been more weeks since the mom had been vaccinated, then we saw increasing levels in the cord blood. Um, these are similar plots to what Dr. Edlow was speaking about, comparing maternal and cord blood titers. Um, which seemed to increase um, with time, um, but antibodies were observed in all uh, the core blood specimens. And then the question was, does the timing of maternal vaccination matter for the mom? So um, if, if the mom is vaccinated in the first trimester, um, would that individual mount the same antibody response as someone who is vaccinated in the second or third trimester? So we saw that there were similar antibody levels generated no matter what trimester of um, pregnancy a particular individual was in. We're uh, obviously not been able yet to assess how these antibody levels change from trimester of vaccination to in the cord blood to when mom delivers since we've only pretty much observed the third trimester deliveries at this point, but work is ongoing to assess the levels of antibodies present in the cord blood for women who are vaccinated in the second and the first first trimester of pregnancy. And then regarding side effects following vaccination, we compared the side effects after the first and second vaccine doses in our non-pregnant, pregnant and lactating individuals. Um, these were similar between groups with injection site and soreness being, injection site soreness being the most common side effect after the first vaccine dose uh, for all groups and side effects after the second vaccine dose also included the common headache, muscle aches, fatigue, fever, and chills, as well as some injection site soreness. So there are no significant differences in these between the groups in our study. And now this big question of safety, which has um, uh, been discussed uh, uh, at 
uh, great level. Um, and, and this initial paper um, in the New England Journal of Medicine released last week uh, discussed the first evidence from the V-Safe Pregnancy Registry um, conducted by the CDC. This was in the first um, two and a half months of mRNA vaccination to pregnant patients. Patients self-report to the V-Safe um, application. They can say they are pregnant or not, and then a follow-up call is given to women um, and individuals who uh, report that they are pregnant. 827 individuals have completed pregnancies to date, and of those, no safety signals have been noted with uh, rates of miscarriage and preterm birth the same as pre-pandemic. Um, this um, and other observations have now led the CDC to recommend pregnant patients receive the COVID-19 vaccine um, during uh, pregnancy. This is a recommendation made just last Friday. So in summary, um, COVID-19 vaccines are similarly effective in pregnant and lactating individuals as non-pregnant individuals. There is a suggestion that infants will have some protection by maternal vaccination because we do see antibodies transferred to breast milk and cord blood, but exactly what degree of protection those will confer remains um, a subject of ongoing study. Side effects to the vaccine itself um, uh, are similar in all the groups of patients. Um, and uh, so far, all the evidence suggests that COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy is safe and is recommended in pregnancy by the CDC. I'd like to thank all the great collaborators, particularly um, Dr. Edlo and Dr. Alter at Mass General and the Reagan Institute and our COVID vaccine um, team here and our funders. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ofer Levy. Dr. Levy is a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, senior physician at Boston Children's Hospital and director of the Precision's Vaccine Program. He will address the role of pediatric vaccinations in curbing the pandemic. Dr. Levy. Thank you for that. Um, so my title today is the role of pediatric vaccination in curbing the pandemic. As mentioned, my name is Ofer Levy. I'm a physician scientist in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Boston Children's Hospital, where I direct the Precision Vaccines Program. Our research is in part uh, supported by the Mass CPR. I also serve as a, a member of FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, and I will point out that my comments today are my personal opinion and not official FDA statements. As part of the work we, we conduct with support from NIH and from uh, MassCPR, our Precision Vaccines Program is considering how to leverage cutting edge technologies to accelerate and de-risk vaccine development for vulnerable populations. Vaccine responses can vary based on age, sex, and other demographic features. And our program is uh, exploring how to accelerate and improve this process using systems biology technologies that measure the cells and molecules in a biologic sample, such as a blood sample collected from individuals before or after a vaccine. And we are also able to model human immune responses outside the body uh, using blood collections from cord blood in infants, uh, from peripheral blood uh, in older infants or middle-aged or elderly adults. And we're able to model responses of the white blood cells, the leukocytes outside the body to vaccines uh, in a way that is predictive of the safety and efficacy of those vaccines inside the body. Uh, this, these new technologies were supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and NIH and uh, we are partnering uh, across several consortia to apply them uh, in the context of coronavirus vaccines. Uh, our program with the support of MassCPR has now identified uh, vaccines that may be optimized for use in the elderly and that do not require freezing uh, and may be a helpful part of the global armamentarium against this dreaded pandemic. Now, obviously, uh, some of the lead vaccines used in the United States right now are a new technology called messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines, such as the Pfizer and Moderna product. Uh, these vaccines uh, have RNA that encodes, for example, the viral spike protein. And when that is injected into our muscle, the RNA tells the muscle cells to make the coronavirus spike protein and the antibody response to that, we believe, protects against COVID. 
Now, as these vaccines are currently authorized uh, in essentially in adults with a Pfizer vaccine uh, authorized for ages 16 years and older, as a pediatrician, uh, I've been very much reflecting on the potential importance of pediatric coronavirus immunization. And I recently authored a commentary for the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, together with Stan Plotkin, who's commonly alluded to as the, as the grandfather of uh, vaccinology in the United States. Stan will point out, other than clean drinking water, vaccines are the most important biomedical intervention known to humans, and it is hard to overstate the beneficial impact of vaccines on human health and human history. I mean, people used to be afraid to send their kids to swim in a swimming pool because they were going to get polio. When was the last time we worried about that? We used to have millions of deaths due to smallpox. When was the last time you worried about smallpox? The world is rediscovering how important, how critical vaccines are. My friend in Tel Aviv just sent me a video from last Friday of everybody sitting outside in cafes on a Friday, kids playing in the street, no masks required outdoors. That's the power of, of potentially reaching herd immunity. So now why would we wanna consider potentially mandatory pediatric coronavirus immunization? Stan and I came up with 10 reasons. Number one, although uncommon, severe COVID does occur in children in the form of the multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome in children that Dr. Randolph just described to you. Children do become infected and excrete virus that could infect parents, teachers, and other children. Childhood infection is often asymptomatic, so other precautions may not suffice. Uh, immunization of children may provide priming uh, that would at least uh, protect them for an accelerated response to infection or revaccination. Vaccination of children will be needed to reach high coverage and potentially herd immunity. Viral mutations are generating variants such as the one from the United Kingdom that are spreading more readily to children. Pediatric vaccination programs have a highly successful international track record in making major advances in reducing infectious diseases. There is a well-developed international infrastructure for pediatric immunization that would be a practical path to ensure global immunization against SARS-CoV-2. And after immunizing teachers, pediatric vaccination may further accelerate opening of schools, normalizing children's activities, key for their well-being and parental work productivity. And finally, as is the case with other vaccines, mandatory vaccination of children guarantees high coverage as opposed to voluntary. Now, vaccine development has to begin with safety. We give vaccines to healthy people, they better be safe. And safety, I'd like to highlight, is considered at every phase of vaccine discovery and development. This is from a review article in the journal Science that I published together with David Knipe and others in the mass CPR in the preclinical stage using our in vitro systems that have reactogenicity biomarkers in animal studies. And then, of course, as we march through phase one, two, and three clinical trials, the safety data are very important. And serving on that FDA committee, the safety data are made publicly available to every American to see as we publicly debate the merits of a potential emergency use authorization. And after a vaccine gets authorized or approved and is pushed out to a population, safety surveillance continues in the form of passive and active surveillance for safety. What has been the progress towards pediatric coronavirus vaccines? This table summarizes clinical trials ongoing by Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. Uh, Pfizer has announced completion of a study, well, sorry, uh, a preliminary analysis of a study of children ages 12 to 15 years, 12 to 15 years of age, over 2,000 children. According to the sponsor, according to Pfizer, FDA hasn't looked at this yet as far as I know, or at least I haven't seen the data, but what Pfizer is stating is that zero cases of COVID were noted in the vaccine group and 18 in the control group, and that therefore the vaccine is highly effective in 12 to 15-year-old children and Pfizer stated uh, that the results indicated safe and effective. I don't want to prejudge that. We have to look at the actual data. Uh, that sounds promising. We'll let the data speak. There's ongoing phase one, two, three study of uh, age de-escalation going down to six months of age, down to six month old infants with the Pfizer product. That uh, effort started in March and the results are pending. And Moderna uh, has studies in the 12 to 15 year old group and is also age de-escalating, exploring doses. When uh, dosage, when you uh, give a vaccine to young children, you can't assume it's the same dose as the adults. So it takes a bit longer. You have to go through the dose uh, escalation to see what's safe and effective. And then finally, the J&J &J platform uh, has an advantage that it, this adenovirus platform has been used in infants for their Ebola vaccine and other programs down to age of one. And they uh, have a study in 12 to 17 
17 year olds, uh, and then presumably are, are considering age de-escalation there as well. All of this is to say that there might be a possible evaluation for a potential emergency use authorization of a pediatric vaccine uh, this summer. And if so, it's possible, it's possible that there could be uh, vaccines available for children uh, ahead of the fall school year. How do we get kids back to school? The Centers for Disease Control, CDC, K through 12 schools can safely reopen within operational guidelines, distancing and masking. So I believe that uh, it's possible to have schools open. That's what CDC is guiding. And, uh, and I think that's critical for their well-being. Uh, immunization of teachers, especially vulnerable teachers, elderly, those with comorbidities, is obviously strongly recommended and urged. Uh, and then two opinion points. It's my opinion that immunization of children is desirable, but not required for in-person classes for the fall of 2021. And another opinion I have is that if CDC guidance is closely followed, the benefits of school reopening should greatly outweigh the risks. And finally, a few words about the importance of a public-private partnership in implementing immunization. You could build the best vaccine in the world, have the best safety and efficacy data, have a transparent FDA process, which we, we do, and still have a situation where some people don't want to take the vaccine. As we know, there is a very broad range of public opinion about vaccines in general and coronavirus vaccines in particular. Uh, we have just finished a systematic review of all approximately 1,000 comments submitted to FDA during the public commentary phase for the Pfizer and Moderna products. And that's now under review in a project I did with Amy Sherman and Elisa Weitzman at Harvard Medical School. Um, but basically uh, in our review, uh, we are highlighting the importance of good communication and partnership uh, between government and the public, healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies. And that communication is critical and sometimes underutilized and under-resourced. Uh, to learn more about our efforts at the Precision Vaccines Program that is bringing precision medicine to vaccinology, you have my email and uh, our program manager is Nicole or Coco Lewis with her emails there. And for those of you who do Twitter, we're at PREC vaccines, at P-R-E-C vaccines. Thank you. Um, we can't, I can't hear you, Howard, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, four wonderful, wonderful talks. And we have a lot of time now for uh, questions and answers. Um, several questions have been submitted in the um, Q&A room. Some of them have been already been answered, uh, but we also had um, a few dozen questions that were submitted uh, ahead of time. And um, so I'd like to um, uh, pose some of these questions to you and have sort of consolidated some of them together. Um, Starting off with, um, uh, doc, and this is for Dr. for Dr. Levy. There's this common perception, um, a common perception that that children only infrequently have serious problems from COVID, um, that there's no transmission in schools, and that children aren't really important uh, sources of transmission. But can you can you put it in like an overall perspective of how concerning is is COVID in children? Well, you know, Dr. Randolph pointed out to you that there are children who end up with severe symptoms and end up in a hospital. That's the tip of the iceberg. We've got to assume that for everyone, right, Adrian, that ends up at your door in the ICU, there are many more that hit the hospital floor and not the ICU. And for those, there are many more that went to the ED and were well enough to go back home. And of those, there are many who are just at home and not sick at all or even asymptomatic carrying the virus, right? And with every passing week, there are more and more reports in the literature of the wide range of symptoms, right? The variability in which this presents all the way down to no symptoms, right? And what are the long term consequences of the virus. It's still under research. So uh, there's definitely a burden there, enough of a burden, in my opinion, in my opinion, to merit pediatric immunization. And then children can, in principle, spread to others, maybe not as easily as adults spread, but they can. Um, you know, it was interesting serving on, on the FDA committee, uh, the first one, the Pfizer debate. Uh, FDA posed a question after a long day of deliberation. Here's the question to the committee. Uh, do, does the evidence, do the known and suspected benefits of the Pfizer vaccine exceed the known and suspected 
uh, side effects in, in those 16 years of age and over. And there were members of that committee, I think there were 24 of us who took the view of like, look, there weren't that many 16 and 17 year olds in the trial for Pfizer, number one. And number two, the kids don't get that sick. So why are we rushing to this? Let's make it 18 years and up. And I took a different view. I said, look, if we're gonna get out of this mess, we're gonna to have to have a pediatric immunization component to this. Because if you look at vaccines that penetrate into a population to very high levels, 80, 90% around the world, they're almost always pediatric vaccines. The bulk of the global vaccine infrastructure is a pediatric infrastructure. And to my view, uh, as long as obviously safety comes first, we've got to establish the safety, but if we have safe products, that's gonna be part of the solution here. And that argument carried the day. I was very happy that uh, Eric Rubin, uh, who served with me on the committee also jumped in and agreed with that point. And it ended up being 17 to four vote in favor and FDA moved forward on that basis. Um, so with the 16 years olds now have an option. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, I, I welcome the data. We look forward to seeing uh, the data that will be publicly posted, the safety and efficacy in the 12 to 15 year olds and eventually uh, younger in age. And if those data look good, I, I think it'll be a major win. Thanks. There, this is for Dr. Randolph. Um, we, we hear and are learning more and more about PASC, about the post-acute sequelae of COVID in adults and manifestations that we're seeing in them. Um, we now have more than a year of kids or children. Um, are we seeing PASC in children and what does it look like? Specifically, um, are we seeing any developmental delays, cognitive deficits? Um, what do we know and what don't we know? So first of all, there has not been any rigorous studies really evaluating the effects of kids who had minimal symptoms from COVID, the mildly affected that, that um, children with uh, COVID and following them up. There really have not been good studies. What we do know are a few things. Those kids with uh, MIS-C tend to have a lot of issues later on settle but neurologic findings about half um, and a lot of muscular weakness. Now, some of that may be because their heart was involved. And when you have myocarditis, you're told to basically not do, you know, act to really limit your activities. So, you know, their walk scores are, are lower um, when they're trying to walk in a three minute, they're, they're at the uh, lowest end of the percentile, like the third percentile. They lose muscle mass, all kinds of uh, later complications, as well as their heart. The biggest concern about those kids with MIS-C is their heart. What does it mean long-term about their heart? So Jane Newberger, one of my colleagues at Boston Children's is leading a national study with NHLBI funding with about following up all these kids' hearts to see, because it can cause scarring. I mean, their hearts were very affected acutely and luckily they, they recovered fairly quickly, but does, what does it do long-term? What it happens to them later, especially as they get older? So that's one thing on the MIS-C. On the acute COVID, those ones who did get pneumonia are coming back now. And our pulmonary um, group and other people reporting the same thing, they're showing the same issues the adults have. Um, they still have um, you know, issues with their shortness of breath and lack of, um, you know, energy. And if you do a CT scan of their lungs, they still have inflammation there. Same thing as you see in the adults. So um, those kids that did get affected um, and now more and more, it's going to be kids because they're the ones who are not vaccinated and don't have protection. So, you know, as, as far as the ones who get sick. So, and, and, you know, although Miss C is the, um, the, you know, category of that really alarmed people. I think that the numbers wise, the kids with acute COVID-19 in the hospital way over, um, the numbers are way more of acute COVID-19 in the hospital. So, um, you know, kids are not protect, completely immune from getting complications of acute COVID-19. And this, this virus has a range of symptoms, including the brain. It can just right, like go right attack the brain without even attacking the lung. 
It's not your usual flu virus. I mean, flu can do that too, but rarely. This virus has all kinds of complications. The GI system, they can get admitted with the GI system. A lot of them are suspected of having appendicitis and get their appendix out, but they didn't actually have appendicitis. It affects all kinds of organ systems. So I think that we really should not discount the effect in children and the numbers in children are going up. The proportion in children, people need to be aware of that has been going up as far as the percentage affected of COVID. Now, of course that makes sense as you protect more and more of the elderly and there are less and less of the ones hospitalized. Um, the proportion of the people who are unprotected are gonna be more and more of the hospitalized. So, um, just bringing that up. And then also just to bring up as an influenza researcher, that's my main, my, what I usually do, you know, influenza research, we get very alarmed if kids are just hospitalized with influenza. That's our outcome, right? So let's go back to normal, the normal world where, um, you know, we don't want our kids getting influenza pneumonia or getting it hospitalized with these complications early in life because we don't know what it means long term. We want to prevent that with vaccination. So I think we have to go back to now the normal world where, yes, they're not getting in the ICU with high death rates, but we don't even want hospitalization. We don't want pneumonia. It can affect our lung function long term. We don't want neurologic involvement. We don't want anything with our kids, you know? So I just supporting what Ofer was saying. I mean, we want them to get immunity. We don't want them having any complications. All of these things can have long-term issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question for Dr. For Dr. Edlow. Um, so COVID vaccination during pregnancy is still, um, for the most part, a, a data-free zone. And we've had a lot of questions from the audience about uh, concerns about birth defects, what is the safest trimester. The official recommendations from all the organizations is that it's shared decision-making between the doctor and the patient about whether to get a vaccine during pregnancy. What, what are the key facts for pregnant people to know in considering uh, when they make their shared decision-making about whether or not to receive a vaccine? That's a great question. And, you know, I'll also invite Katie to jump in here um, because she has a lot of expertise in this area as well. Um, I think, you know, first of all, the CDC, even though they haven't updated their website, did officially change their guidance on Friday with the publication of their data in New England Journal to recommending that all pregnant individuals get the vaccine. Um, and that's based on the balancing the risk of severe maternal morbidity and mortality against the very um, good safety profile of the vaccine and all the data that the CDC has acquired to date. And then studies like the one that Katie and I did with Dr. Alter's group and others that have been published since have demonstrated that the vaccine works well to make antibodies in pregnant and lactating mothers. So, you know, you have the efficacy piece, it works. The safety data to date are very reassuring, although many have noted in the chat that there are certain you know, safety considerations about vaccination in general that people want to know that those types of data need long-term follow-up. But the data that we can acquire most immediately suggests that there's not a risk of birth defects, there's not an increased risk of miscarriage, there's not an increased risk of preterm delivery, there's not an increased risk of pregnancy loss or fetal demise. Um, and complications like, or side effects like fever are very easily treated with Tylenol. So we don't see any safety signals and we do see benefits and that's where the CDC's recommendation came from. But I agree, you know, it's, it's useful for pregnant individuals to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with their care provider, whether it's a midwife, physician, um, family medicine doctor, whomever that they are getting care from to talk about their occupation, their exposure to COVID-19, what the rates are in their community of SARS-CoV-2, um, what their comorbidities are, uh, obesity, diabetes, um, pre-existing lung disease, immune compromise, all of these things may push people in one direction or another with respect to vaccination. But I think the more data that we acquire, the more reassuring it is about vaccination and pregnancy. So, Katie, did you think I left anything out there? The only point I would add is that um, 
we do see some potential neonatal benefit as well, given that the antibodies cross into breast milk and the cord blood. And so while we don't have any other method to protect neonates, especially right now, except for adults around them being vaccinated, pregnant women who get the vaccine may also confer um, benefits by transferring antibodies by being vaccinated during pregnancy. So I also stress that there are potential benefits to both them and their infants by being vaccinated during pregnancy. So you mentioned um, uh, comorbidities and we have had questions in the, uh, in the chat and previously about, um, this is regarding um, MISC in, in children. Um, what are the are there associated variables that are uh, or variables that are associated with increased risk of developing MISC? And are there children that we should be particularly concerned about? Um, Dr. Dr. Levy or Dr. Randolph? Yeah, I will defer to Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we um so we really don't know why some children um get get MISC and others do not. Um and that's one of the that that is a, a very intensive area of research. We just received a large uh, amount of funding from the CDC just to look at that specific question. It's very rare. Um, um, thank goodness. Thank goodness it's rare. The risk of acute COVID-19 and complications is higher. And in fact, um, there's been in all those patients who got vaccinated, um, from what I can tell, from what they reported, although I don't have all the data as Ofer was saying, um, they weren't reporting cases of um, Miss C. So they were not in those 12 to 15 year olds. So I think that, um, and also there's a Miss A, there's a adult version of it, and they didn't report any of that in young individuals who are vaccinated. So as far as I know, we have no data that patients who are vaccinated um, or vaccines are triggering that. We have data that patients who are unvaccinated can get that. So um, I think we have to, um, there, you know, that's reassuring that there's been a lot of young people. I mean, Miss C goes all the way up to age 20. A lot of people were vaccinated. Nobody reported that complication right, who are now 16 to 20, um, thousands and thousands. The frequency of MISCs somewhere around three per 10,000 exposed to SARS-CoV-2. We have some a, a data that we just are working on on that, unpublished. But um, I think that um, when you think about that and you think about the other risk of actually getting COVID is higher you know, and it could protect against MIS-C. So now we're doing a vaccine effectiveness about how well the vaccine protects against getting MIS-C as well as getting acute COVID in children and adolescents. That's one the study that the CDC just funded us for. Is, are, do we have any, um, so we know that vertical transmission is not common, but do we have any data on long-term outcomes or one-year outcomes of infants born to mothers who had COVID during pregnancy? That's the, that's the million dollar question. That's definitely something that, that we want to try to look at with our cohort. And, you know, we're trying to look at that um, with some of our collaborators, including Lael Yonker, who has a large child cohort of um, the babies that were born to the mothers in our study um, and try to follow those children up for neurodevelopmental complications, metabolic complications. Um, also, now with the vaccine, it's interesting to think about the antibody responses that the children whose mothers receive the vaccines will have um, going forward. So we're trying to follow these children up and also consider collecting blood and even stool from them to understand these questions better. But we don't have those data yet. Okay. You, you could extrapolate from other um, data that we know about other maternal viral infections in pregnancy and just maternal immune activation in pregnancy in general, that there could theoretically be neurodevelopmental risk to children who are exposed in utero, and that may correlate with the severity of maternal illness and maternal cytokine response and so on. So that's, it's definitely a very important direction for future research, and those answers will become clear, maybe not even for seven to 10 years from now. Um, are there, there are some questions, uh, several questions regarding the, uh, the, the variants. Um, 
do we have any information about whether any of the variants that have been identified to date have any specific issues or problems or uh, in pregnant women or in pregnant people or in, or in children? Anybody can answer that. Well, there have been observations that, that the UK variant was spreading to a higher proportion in, in children. Um, and uh, so those observations are, are concerning. There are variants emerging that are more prone to spread between individuals. The, the, the virus has a spread rate. And you know many variants emerge. Some of them are neutral, don't make a difference. Some of them are harmful to the virus. The ones we focus on are the ones that are problematic to us. And, and those rare ones uh, include situations where the virus becomes more transmissible between individuals and or more pathogenic, making you sicker. And there are, there's more and more data that some of the, the variants unfortunately can do that. Uh, and that some of these have spread more readily in younger and younger individuals. Some of what we might be seeing is just as more and more elderly people get immunized, you're also seeing more and more viral spread in younger people. So there are a combination of factors likely at play. Uh, I saw an article in the New York Times uh, about the state of Michigan, uh, the, the doctors there stating they see younger and younger people admitted to hospitals in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and some of them ended, ending up in the ICU. So that the demographics are shifting and that may be variants, it may be seasonality, it may be who's immunized and who's not. All of these factors are playing out. I think the good news is that up to now, uh, the vaccines we have are most effective against the most severe outcomes for all the variants. That, that, that even if you do have a breakthrough in infection, it tends to be mild with an infection for an immunized individual. That the vaccines are best at protecting against the most dreaded complications, ICU admission and death. So I think the meth message is to get the vaccines out. We, we've had a few questions specifically addressing the immediate postpartum period and the contact of the, of the mother and the baby. Um, could somebody address the issue about precautions? Um, you know, early on, babies were being separated from their, if the mother had COVID, the babies were being separated in order to reduce risk of infection. What, what's, the, what's the current approach if a, if a person has COVID while, while, while delivering? Um, what do we do with the with the baby in terms of breastfeeding, isolation, contact precautions, things like that? But mostly the uh, so there's a discussion usually with the neonatologist um, and then um, it's shared decision making. But most moms are choosing to stay with the infants to encourage um, breastfeeding and maternal infant bonding, which I think is the right decision. You know, when we were separating infants and moms, um, they were going home with the family anyway. So we were just temporarily, you know, creating this separation when they were gonna go home with the family and likely better to encourage appropriate masking, decreasing like the virus transmission, but also encouraging breastfeeding and bonding, which should have protective effects for the infant. Do you, do you, do you oh. counsel the family with any other specifics about testing or other precautions that other family members should take? We do, you Go know, we, yeah, we, we just give people the usual, the same precautions as other, um, as other people who have family members with COVID infection leaving the hospital that the family needs to isolate um, and that, you know, people definitely should be masked and using hand hygiene around the baby because the baby is especially vulnerable to res respiratory infection of in small airways. But um, I was only going to also add to what Katie said about breastfeeding that we know breastfeeding has the transfer of protective antibodies for the neonate, but also people have tested breast milk of women infected with SARS-CoV-2 and not seen, um, you know, the virus present in breast milk in most situations. They have seen the virus present on the breast, on the skin. So with good breast and hand hygiene, it shouldn't be that people are transmitting virus through breast milk to babies. So that's also reassuring for breastfeeding. Thank you, everyone. We are at the hour now. So our session is over. Still a lot of uh, unanswered questions, um, but uh, they will be uh, posted and we'll, some of them will continue to be answered and we'll be able to, I think, find them on our, on our website. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, all of our participants, all of our speakers, uh, thank you very much.